And um, yeah, man, actually the original question I, I, I remember was, what was your experience of salvation? Um, and um, uh, how, did, how did that bring you to where you're at now? And uh, I remember clearly this moment in Korea. And I know Brandon came to Korea with us once. Uh, just crazy. It's just a crazy experience. <laughs> it's, it's a whole different culture. Uh, I know Elder Perry, you were there with us there too. Um, a few years before then, I was in Korea and um, there was uh, somebody giving a lecture, just uh, sharing about God's word. And he started to describe the, how God's heart is, what, what, how, like, what, what's going on with God's heart and how does God relate to us? And he was giving one of the perspectives. I know there's many perspectives of God's heart. There's different aspects of it. But he was particularly, he was painting a picture and he was like, I want you to imagine your parents. So maybe you guys can do this. Was, imagine your parents and you guys are on this beautiful green field and your, your parents and you are running, but they're running after you. And so your parents, they're running together. So I'm picturing my dad and my mom and they're running after me. But every time they get close, you run faster than them and you run farther. And you run farther. So they run and they put in all their effort to get to you. And then you just run away again. And they keep doing this. But then the ground starts to get really rocky. And they start to fall and tumble as they're trying to race after you. But you continue to run away. And so this keeps going. And then you start to see that there's tears rolling down their eyes. Their knees are bloody. Their hands are scarred. Their face is just desperate to reach you. But every time they get close, you run farther away. And he stopped for a moment and, and, and said that. And he said, that's God. And I remember I was sitting in the back of the room. And this was the point in my life where I did, I've never really felt God. Uh, I know Dr. Rouse was sharing earlier that he grew up in the church. And he always felt like he could feel God. I never felt that. I mean, I was, I was, I was raised in the church. But, man, it was a horizontal experience. I was there for the friends. <laughs> 100% there for the community, not really there for God. That was the first moment in my life where I felt God's love and how desperate he was to reach me. So that's, that was, and I remember breaking down, I was crying. I cried for a week. I cried and I was crying that I got, I got, I was crying so much. I got sick. I got sent to the hospital and I was crying in the hospital. That I, I, I couldn't leave. I was just quarantined in the hospital. This was pre COVID, you know, it's like, Quarantine was a thing, and I was crying, and the doctor was so confused. <laughs> What's going on with this guy? But uh, all I could think about was, man, that that love, and um, that was my moment of salvation. I, I feel in my life where I let go of everything, and I have been on a journey since trying to grow. <laughs> so I owe I owe a lot of that to the people in my life who were there. So. That's just a little bit of my background, why, why I do what I do. These principles actually were the things being taught to me at that time when that lecture was talking. So when I share today, um, honestly, it comes from a place of that kind of heart where, uh, yeah, I, can you guys see the kind of the colored screen? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's coming from that kind of place. So, all right. So. We're gonna jump in here. Um, I hope you guys had a good chance to share with each other. And we're gonna try to start off with a little bit of an introduction and then jump in to these principles that we're gonna be sharing. And I wanna start with the point of happiness because I think it's pretty much principle in our life that everybody in the world is striving to attain, reach, acquire happiness in their life each and every single person. And so we're all on this journey, you might say, uh, trying to reach this point of happiness. And we can describe that ideal space of happiness as God's ideal of creation. It's his purpose. He wants us to be happy and we're meant to experience that in our life. And so if it has something to do with God and if it's God's ideal, then we can infer and we understand very clearly that it has something to do with love, that 
all of that we're striving for. You don't get happiness unless there is love. But there's many different types of love. Actually, there's two types. There's, um, there's the beautiful selfless love that God has, that uh, God carries on his shoulder and, and, and leads us with. And it's that experience of the, the mom and dad running after you endlessly. It's eternal and it's inevitable. And then there's the other type of love. And it's a tragic reality that we, we see. And it's this corrupted, selfish love that leads to these things that we see on the screen now. And all of these, I know many of us are, have experienced these on different levels in our life, family crises, drug and alcohol abuse, but we see this especially in our young people today. And so I'm addressing us as the YCLC, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you can feel like, you know, we're all kind of leaders in the world towards raising our young people. And currently they're facing these things like they've never seen before, but I even think it gets a little bit more nuanced and, and dangerous. We start to see things like this, corrupted love manifesting. I don't know if you know what TikTok is. For those of the elder folk, TikTok has been this big craze where people post videos of themselves dancing. And it's kind of taken over by people who have a sense of wanting to be seen. They have a me first kind of attitude. They, they're doing what they're doing because they want they want attention from the masses and they want the money that comes with it. And it's this craze, it's taken over. It's on every single kid's uh, applications on their phones. Kids are digesting this um, more than they're digesting Facebook, Instagram, or, any, or Snapchat. And it's this culture of me, me, me. It's a me first culture. It's all about how I look, how I am. It's the pursuit of these materialistic desires and goods and uh, the, the, the uh, appreciation and acknowledgement of the people around us, which isn't inherently bad, but when that becomes our focus and there's nothing bigger than that, then it becomes incredibly selfish. It, it starts to lay on our hearts and it seeps into our culture and we bring that into our families, into our communities, and we start to see this on a worldwide level where Young people who were young before are now leading this country, leading this world. And it's still a me first culture. And so my question to that is, where is God? Where is God in our young people today? There's this quote from James White. He, he wrote this book called Meet Generation Z. And he says, the most defining mark of members of Generation Z in terms of their spiritual lives is their spiritual illiteracy. They do not know what the Bible says. They do not know the basics of Christian belief or theology. They do not know what the cross is all about. And they do not know what it means to worship. And so we start to see a trend. And I put this one in particular because I want us to see that. I know everyone knows this. There's a trend of an increase of spiritual but not religious types. That's the people in our age, the millennials and the Gen Z. But it comes across on all races, all party affiliations. Um, all genders. This is this general trend of people that are spiritual but not religious. And then we look a little bit deeper and we see a general trend among from the elders all the way to Gen Z, this kind of newer age group, that there's a constant trend of decrease in the number of Christians or people who have a faith and an increase in the number of people who are agnostic, atheist, or simply nothing. So this speaks volumes about where our culture is at. And this, to me, is incredible. So they, they did a study. What is the barrier of faith? The biggest barrier of faith for people in the Gen Z and the millennials. And the number one thing was that I have a hard time believing that a good God would allow so much evil or suffering in the world. And for millennials, it's that same one, and they add one on top of that, and that's that Christians are hypocrites. I don't say this to, to, to lessen and dampen our attitude. I, set this, I, sent, I, I, I say this to, to, to establish a context with what we're dealing with. But this in particular is powerful. This, to me, hurts. But at the same time, at the same time, Brandon and all of our ministers here, this actually should give us hope. 
because this is the most pertinent question about spirituality on the hearts of our young people today. And I know, Brandon, you have an answer to this question. So you can solve the most pertinent question on our young people's hearts today. It tells us clearly of the mission that we have, that we are in the position to bring people through Jesus Christ, through the medium, as mediums ourselves, to a living, thriving, personal relationship with God. And that was the concern on Father Moon's heart when he was 15, 16 years old, depending on which country you're in, in war-torn Korea in 1935. He was praying, and his testimony starts with asking that same question that was just presented above. He asks, and this is a quote, Why has God created a world so filled with sorrow and despair? Why was the all-knowing, all-powerful God leaving the world in such pain? What should I do for my tragic homeland? I wept in tears as I asked these questions repeatedly. And then Jesus appeared before him, and Jesus called on him. And as I was simultaneously, simultaneously overcome with fear so great, I felt I might die. I was also filled with gratitude so profound, I felt I might explode. Jesus spoke clearly about the work I have to do. And his words were extraordinary, having to do with the saving of humanity from its suffering and bringing joy to God. And so he admits to this, that it was a struggle to receive this call by revelation from Jesus. And so he went on his pilgrimage around Korea and he saw the pain and suffering of his people. And after that point, he said to, he said to Jesus, like, okay, I'm going to live my life in total commitment to the will that you've asked me to fulfill. And now Mother Moon has carried forth that mission. God has led her. And we, we, we know her story. Her testimony is that she grew up in the Christian church. And her love for God and Jesus brought her along to trust the word into a place where she was then married to Father Moon and then took on the leadership. And it's just an incredible work that she's done. Um, she's actually the only female leader of her level that's leading on a spiritual and religious sphere right now in our world. It speaks volumes. And she recalls in the form of a prayer in her memoir about her commitment to God. And she says this, I am investing everything to heavenly parent. I travel to the north, south, east, and west in order to teach the truth of heaven's providence to those who have ears but have not heard and those who have eyes but have not seen. She calls out her mission. And so recently she gave us, she kind of asked us to inherit that mission. And I felt this deeply. She's, she expressed, I sincerely hope that you can all raise your voices to let all the people know of our creator. And in advancing the realization of God's one big family. And she says this specifically to the clergy. This is our mission. And so this is the precedent upon which we're going to share about the divine principle. In order to counter this culture that we have of selfish love and to bring our young people into the fullness of God's love, we need to start with the ideal. We need to start with what it is that we're bringing them to. Stephen Covey talks about this. He's a famous guy, kind of guru. Um, and he talks about how you have to start with the end in mind. And that is what YCLC is here to do, bring people into that ideal. And so if we're going to bring people into the ideal of God, we have to naturally answer the question of what is the nature of God? Who is it that we're bringing our brothers and sisters into a relationship with? And um, Father Moon describes it like this. And honestly, we all feel this. We all already know this, is that God is love. And at the center of everything is God's love. God needs love. Man needs love. And the angelic world also needs love. If the world had been centered on God's love from the beginning, it would have not only been an ideal beginning, but the direction and the final results would have also been ideal. God, man, and the angelic world would have formed one perfect world, freely communicating with each other, centering upon God's love. That's how Father Moon describes it. And so we have God. And throughout history, people have questioned, how do we get to a place of happiness? Well, the answer is not in what we look at in our material world. The answer has to be found in that cause, the first cause, which is God and understanding his nature. And so how do we understand God and illuminate him? It, Romans 1.20 kind of gives us a little bit of 
uh, a way to look at this. And, and, and Paul's describing that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen from what has been made in his creation. But I want to stop for a moment and acknowledge that in, in, in Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, it talks about how the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so I want to stop and just say that I, we, we give honor and credence to the perfect expression of God. We can look at nature, and, and, and we're going to do that now, because I think nature provides us another way in a more universal way for others, especially if we're studying this as YCLC, that means we're in the position to share this with those who have no relationship with God, right? It gives us another way of seeing how God's truth is expressed, but the highest expression of it is Jesus and the word of God. That is the highest and the fundamental source of that truth. Um, but how do we bring people there? So even you have Einstein who gives credence to this, to this, uh, to this um, that we can see God in nature. In Psalms 19, 1 to 12, heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Wow. Day after day, they, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And so we look at things. It's Maybe it almost seems blasphemous, but we can take a scientific approach to this. And especially this is geared towards those who may not have accepted God, Christ, and the word as the authority in their life yet. Um, and it's almost similar to how Paul goes about it. In, birth, in, that one, in, in Romans 1.20, Paul's talking to some humanists. He's talking to the Gentiles who are having a very hard time to receive the, ideal, the idea of an invisible God. And so he describes that verse. So in the same way, we can use a scientific method of looking at what God has created and deeming from that the nature of God. And so we see that God has created as the invisible origin, all the things within creation, all the things within time and space, and especially us as human beings. In the same manner, you have an artist. An artist creates a work of art. And, and in that work of art displays that character. So I show this particular photo. Um, I, I'm gonna ask you, Brandon, maybe you can answer. What do you feel when you see this photo? This, this piece of artwork? What can you infer particularly about the artist when you look at this? Try to take myself off mute, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> man, um, that's a couple of things that come to mind. I think, uh, I mean, it looks dark in his room. Um, and I think that even when like, the, like it's no, it looks like it's no light in there, but he does have an instrument. Um, you know, where he can go ahead and, and he can sing, he can use music and melodies even in a dark place. So for me, as a believer, it makes me think of the Psalms on how David was. Even in the dark hours of his life, he was able to make music to be able to reverence to God. And, um, you know, we look at God in a dark world and his instrument was Jesus. And he plays his love on the instrument of Jesus that even in a dark world, he can have light. And Jesus is the, is the song of God's heart. Whew. Sheesh. <laughs> Are you taking art history? <laughs> man, oh man, that was beautiful. So this this particular one is is called the old guitarist. And I, I love the way you took it, Brandon. Actually, it shows me, it actually gives me a lot of hope. This was done in Pablo Picasso's blue period, 1901 to 1904, where actually his his long, long, his 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 good friend of his just passed away. And he fell into a depression. And I, I don't know when a part of that journey, this one was, was done. Um, I, I, but I know that this was a difficult time for Pablo Picasso. It's difficult. And maybe there's some hope there. Maybe the instrument says that. I wonder if it was done in the latter half of that 1901 to 1904. But it, you can feel his character. You can feel his personality behind that. There's something there. Um, that, that, that clearly shows out that, that pain he's feeling. And um, in the same manner, we look at God in the, the mountains and what he's created and his children that he's created. And we can see the character of God. And in divine principle, it acknowledges two fundamental characteristics that work within a pair system. And you'll hear this a lot, a pair system, a duality. 
that is manifested in all of God's work of art. And we begin, Divine Principle begins with talking about the fundamental characteristic of masculinity and femininity that's within all of creation. You can call that yang and yin if you're more of that oriental side, or you can call that positive negative if you're more on the scientific or the masculine and feminine um, for us. And so we see this across all levels of being, humans, animals, plants, molecules, positive, negative, he, he, he stamina and pistol, animals, male and female. And for human beings, there's man and there's woman. And we can see this everywhere. You can challenge this all you want, but there is dual characteristics that keep this universe in order and allow us to interact with one another. And if that's the case, then we can make an inference that God must also have that characteristic because he's created these things as his expression, like an artist. And so we call that an original masculinity or an original femininity. And, and we know this, we feel this, we feel God in so many different ways. Um, the motherly heart of God, the fatherly heart of God. Um, and so we see here a pair system. Father Moon describes it like this, is that when we observe our universe, we recognize that every being exists through the union of paired elements. This is true on all levels. The supreme creations of God, human beings, are either men or women. The first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, were the original ancestors of mankind. Then what is the purpose of this pair system? Why did God create in this way? The creator divided all these things in male and female so that they might unite through their give and take of love. Through the action of love, each species then multiplies and then extends itself, its lineage. So God divides himself in the masculine and feminine so that love can then exist. We can then relate in love um, and we can relate with him in love. So this is the characteristic. And, and these aren't just assertions made out of the blue. These are actually declared within biblical scripture. And we see that in Genesis 1, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God says it. I created so that you could be in my expression, male and female. And then Matthew 19, haven't you read? He replied, and he's referring to Genesis 2, 24, that at the beginning of uh, the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh so that they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. The implication of this is that God's intention was for man and woman to be together. And so we're talking about corrupted love, selfish love. And we see that God's intention was that everything exists for relationship, harmonious, united relationship. We can imagine an electron even. An electron is built to be in relationship with a proton. And in that relationship, I, to me, science describes God's love, that harmony of that relationship of them coming together and as they circle around one another, around a common purpose to build, that becomes a requirement for existence. And upon that foundation of God's love bringing all of creation into harmony, we then can exist. And so we see that if we go against that principle, if we live in our relationships in conflict and in division, we are inherently going against God's intention. And therefore, we as a human beings and as society start to collapse. And that's what we're witnessing right now. Dominique, I know you talked about this. So our young people don't see their value. They're not experiencing this kind of love. And we can see this clearly depicted in, in society when, when there was a time when women were treated as lesser. Bible, the Bible, though, clearly depicts that nothing was truly good until women came. So we see that in this understanding, we see that God designed it, that there was harmonious relationship. But that's not the only characteristic. There's a second set of pair systems that we see within God's artwork. And that's that we all have a body. And coupled with a body, everything within creation has an internal nature, some kind of intangible form or existence. And we see that within human beings as our heart. You can't touch my heart. You also can't touch my mind. 
or an animal has their instinct or an animal mind. Plants um, have this too. Molecules have a directive nature that guides them. We call that an internal nature within all things. And if that's within all things, and you, human beings are unique because we have a heart, that's what makes us different. And that means God also as the first cause of all these things in the universe possesses these characteristics. God therefore has an internal nature. God has a heart. He has an intellect, he has an emotion, he has a will, and he also has some kind of external expression. The energy and the natural law that we see in this world, that comes from God. God created with those principles at the, at the, from the outset, and they come into a pair system. But if God has heart, if God has an emotion, that means that when God is close to someone, like we get close to someone, how I feel towards Reverend Tang, <laughs> I feel immense love. And I know others feel that too. God feels that love too. And so when we suffer, God also can feel that suffering in his heart too. And so this relationship exists between internal nature and external form. But one is, uh, and they relate with one another, just like the, the, the uh, masculinity and femininity and to, in a position of cause and result, intangible, tangible, and particularly subject and object. So our internal nature is subject uh, in that if we don't center our, our life on our heart and our relationship with God, we go astray. When our body takes over and becomes the subject of our life, then we start to do some evil things. We start to do some things that we see in this world today when we focus on the material. And so if we dive into this God's heart, I love the way Dr. Dr. Lee describes heart. He describes God's heart as the emotional impulse to seek joy through love. Thus, God's heart can also be expressed as the emotional impulse to love infinitely. It wells up from the bottom of the mind. It is irrepressible even for God himself. In God, there is an emotional impulse, something that he cannot control. So even if I am a criminal, even if I hurt someone's heart, God still chooses to love me. He cannot control it. He cannot help it. Every time I, if I were to break God's heart, every time he turns around and forgives, every time he turns around and says, as if like a child uh, wanting to love his, uh, love anything, you know, like it's so innocent. God's love is. And he resorts to that every time. He cannot control it. To love infinitely, inevitably, intentionally, and absolutely. And we see this in 1 John 3.16. It can all just be simplified down to this. Is that God is love. That's the center of God. Is his heart. And so what is the relationship of God, his heart, and the rest of what he's created? Well, from that first pair of characteristics, we can grasp this is that God is, has a masculine expression and a feminine expression. And if that's the case, then God has within his heart to love infinitely a parental heart. And actually, we can see that that parental heart's probably the closest thing that we can find to the, to, to the way that God loved and the way that Jesus loved. It was like a parent loves a child. Absolutely. You know, Dominique, I see you and your daughter. Oh, my God. That's God's love in, in, in some kind of expression. Um, so with heart serving as that motive, God then loves, wants to love something. And so God, as a, in a masculine expression and a feminine expression, like a parent does, loves his children. And so we see that the feminine expression and masculine expression come together. It actually gives us the fullness of how God intends to interact and, and, and engage with us. We kind of see this in that, you know, sometimes God caresses us and picks us up and, and, you know, wipes the tears from our eyes. And then sometimes God kicks us out of the house, you know, and sends you get, you pick yourself up and keep on going. Sometimes it comes tough. Sometimes it comes um, with a lot of compassion, but every time it comes with love. 
And this is what I see, you know, in a, in a, in a typical church, it's usually pastored by a man. Um, 12% of churches in, in America are pastored by women, I know, but majority are pastored by men. And I always find the churches that are thriving are the ones that treat their first lady or they treat their, their um, the, the woman of God with the equal importance as the pastor themselves. You know, the first lady is that other expression that we get to experience. Um, I always find that to be beautiful. And so we, the first inter- uh, relationship we see is that God is a, is a parental God. God is a parental God. The other is that we see kind of a parallel. And that parallel is that if, if a human being lives their life with their heart, you know, with, with God at the center and they've moved forward, then they live their life well. They, 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 they strive to live a life of selflessness, not selfishness. But when the body, body wins over and becomes subject, it becomes very selfish. We, we put our material desires over our, uh, over our eternal desires. Um, and so in the same way with God and human beings is that if God is not at the focus, if we're intending to overcome selfish love, we have to put God as the subject of our life. It cannot be any other way. If we lose our center with God, then we end up becoming in, it's inorganic almost. <laughs> We inorganically, and Mother Moon puts it best, I actually find. She says it, this, says it like this. It is, times, it is time that we seek a more fundamental solution by turning our attention to God. And this is in response to all the work that we do in politics and economics and, 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 um, and even in our environmental work, which is all important work. But it's time that we seek a more fundamental solution by turning our attention to God, the creator of humanity, and this universe. When people live without a higher overall purpose, individualism and selfishness are triggered and the cosmic order is destroyed. As a result, natural disasters, food shortages, and pollution proliferate, leading to environmental problems, ecological crises, and even threatening the survival of humankind in the natural world. So we see that our solution, and if we're engaging our young people, we have to engage them in a relationship with God. So that's how God interacts. That's how God intended to. We find that that's not the case, but we see this pair system in in work. God's internal nature, his heart, and then also his, his masculine and feminine expression. And we see that God is a God of personality. God is an original parent. God, God works through the means of his heart, his love. God is love. That the whole point was love through his heart. That is the defining trait, the essence of God. It's the character, the essence of Jesus. And therefore, we are meant to do that ourselves. We are created with that motivation, that intention. And that is the basic principle by which love is manifested. That's the basic principle. And so this is uh, what we are describing as the nature of God and and. This, this then translates into how we love one another and how we're meant to go about our lives. And so we're going to talk about how that manifests in the processes and, and of that structure um, within, within our purpose. Um, but I, I want to stop there and I want to go into a breakout on that discussion. And just the, it's two really simple questions. I'll pass it to Kayla is what came up for you? What did you become present to in that? And then if this is true, if these characteristics exist and this is how God is working as a God of love. How does, our, how does our understanding of these natures of God help us solve the issues in our life, in our family, in our young people, and in our world today?
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for sharing. Um, and uh, I hope uh, the presentation itself is stimulating all of our hearts in some way. I'm really grateful. I was in a room with Elder Perry and uh, my mother-in-law and Dr. Rouse. Um, and uh, Elder Perry was talking about awareness and that when we are aware of how God is moving through things and you start to see his love and you start to see his heart and all. Anyway, I was really touched by that. Thank you, Elder Perry. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm going to jump into this next portion and same idea. If we can kind of go back to the core of what we're discussing really is how do we bring back selfless, uh, unconditional love to, to, to our society, especially in our young people in our world today. And so in order to bring people into that understanding and into that ideal that God has desired, we kind of dive into the nature of God. So the nature of God is that God is parental, God has heart, and God is desperately seeking to love. And so how does that manifest in our actual relationships and in our purpose? What is the process to uh, getting to that place with God via this pair system that God has modeled the entire universe off of? And uh, I'm gonna try here, hopefully it's working. You guys can see. Yep. Yes. Nice. Okay. So <laughs> back to Matthew 19, 4 to 6, <laughs> as you guys were talking about, I find this, this verse is powerful and uh, I'll read it again. Haven't you heard? He replied that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one in flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Um, what Jesus is describing here is the pair system. He's describing it. What he's describing is that there is a father and there is a mother, and they're meant to come into union. There's a subject, there's an object, and they can interchange. So one time some, one is subject, sometimes the other is object, depends. Um, and they're in relationship, and then they unite, they become one, they accomplish a union. And this is kind of, it's a, fundamentally, it's that God as the origin is the subject to everything is substantiating himself and dividing himself, you might say. And division is not a negative connotation here. It's simply that God in his image is separating himself into male and female, into two created objects who respond to him as their subject. And these two created objects are man and woman in this sense that we're talking about in terms of Jesus's words. And then they engage in a giving and receiving with one another. They engage in a relationship. And that relationship then, one becomes subject, the other becomes the object. And they start to, prompted by God's desire for this, God inserting love and his energy into all things, they're prompted to engage in relationship with one another. But as Jesus was describing, they're not just creating a relationship, they're creating and becoming one. They're uniting together. They're engaging in a relationship for the sake of something bigger than themselves. And that is the core point, is that in the relationship of a subject and an object or a man and a woman for this matter, they build and become one. And in their union, they are now something greater than what they were before. And we find that in all of creation. We look at, we go back to the subatomic particles. You have the proton, neutron, and electron, and they come together based on a purpose of coming together. And they build something bigger than themselves, a union. And that is the point behind Jesus's teachings and becomes the fundamental underpinning for why Jesus taught about giving up our lives for the sake of gaining our life doing unto others, thinking first the kingdom of heaven. It's always fundamentally, universally God's intention 
that we are striving to realize something that is greater than us. It's the core value of our universe. And so in Ephesians 5.31, Paul talks about the two becoming one. It requires the husband to love their wife and wives to respect their husbands. So in other words, what this is describing is that there is a certain virtue behind this relationship. We look at this relationship here, but there's a virtue there. It's not just that we're engaging in a relationship. I can talk to Ori any day, any day, but does that create a union that's greater than ourselves? The only way is if we're relating to one another as Paul is describing, we're relating out of a sacrificial true love with one another, living for the sake of the other, respecting one another, loving one another. And scripture is describing that if we embody and engage in sacrificial giving and receiving, giving and receiving, then we are forming a union that is greater than ourselves. And that is a miracle. That's the one plus one equals three miracle of God, is that in the relationship of two, you can create something greater than even just the two. That defies all things. That's the, really the power of love. The one thing, the one energy in this universe that when it's given, it multiplies. And so this becomes a foundation for how God is working throughout all of creation. We call it the four position foundation. We see that God created in his image, divided, but intended for them to become one, therefore fully manifesting his image. This is that becomes a foundation upon which love is established. And you can kind of see it. there's four pillars, but really it's a central pillar with God at the center. And then these three pillars surrounding it, creating a triangle, which is the strongest structure in the entire universe. The Lord is one in Mark 12, 29. So too we must become one. And this is the foundation upon which God's love can then stream into, in this case, a husband and wife. What is the greatest thing that they can manifest that is greater than the husband and wife together is the child. And that seeps into the family, into the society, into the nation, and into the world. This is God's original intention that there is a family with which God can then experience love. So what is God's purpose for forming this base, this foundation? Yeah, it's okay, it's circles, but it's, it's a base of love. It's described in Malachi 2.15. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? godly offspring. God is a parent. God, as a heavenly parent, wanted a family, sought to have children, his children multiply and take dominion over his earth that he created for us. And just as God directed us to strive for that higher purpose, we understand that this is the principle here, that God also seeks to and abides by that same principle. He's seeking something greater. God is seeking a family. And this is not to say that God necessarily has needs. You know, God is perfect. This is not to mention that he is any less perfect or any less complete, but it's the fact that it's in the truest nature of God, he is motivated in his heart as a parent to love in a family. That's why he wants a union and he will sacrifice everything to realize it. He will give up his only son to realize it. So that is God's motive. And it started from the very beginning. His desire is 
I want to love. I want something to love. And in that desire, he decides to create. He decides to create with all of his heart. It's irrepressible. He cannot control. He wants to feel a part of a family where two become one centered on him with him at the center. And that, to me, is the biggest of bangs. They talk about it in science. That is it. An explosion of unimaginable, reckless love. Reckless love. Unfathomable. Completely, completely incredible. Everything for us. I imagine whether young people would try to take their life if they knew that. I don't think they could. It washes everything. And so Father Moon, that's my family. family. That's what I used to look like. <laughs> Father Moon describes it. And he says, I invite you. I invite you into, to enter into a transcendent state. Go into prayer. And I ask you guys, you can do this too. You may not agree with what is being expressed, I, I encourage you, as Father Moon encourages, is to prayerfully ask God, what is the center of this universe? And the answer you he will hear, undoubtedly, will be the parent-child relationship, the father and the son. Nothing is more important than the relationship between parent and child. This is because it defines the fundamental relationship between the creator God and human beings. And we juxtapose that, this beautiful, pure, original intention that God had for the world today. We juxtapose and we parallel that with what's going on in our world now. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to think about. So that brings us then to what is then our, the motivation and how does that motivation manifest in our purpose for God creating us? So now we're bringing it to what, uh, what does this mean for, for us? What does this mean for our young people? What, what are we supposed to do with knowing that God is a God of love? So, well, God is a God of love. So God so loved the world as we know that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Of course, thus it is biblically explained that God as a parent is seeking joy. He's seeking joy as, as a God of love, the, the love manifests into joy in our life. He's seeking joy through loving within the structure of the family. And as a parent, that's what he's striving for. But this isn't some one-way street where God is just loving and inserting his love into us. It's a two-way street, of course. Love is a giving and a receiving and, and returning it back. As God's image, we are given the capability to respond to God's love. We see that in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. It's explicitly told to us, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Therefore, God created in order to experience love. He's reaching out. We have to reach back. God is racing after us. We have to do our part. But he will choose that love every time, even if we run away. He will choose that love irrepressibly. So how then do we respond to God's love? How do we return the most joy back to God? How do we give of ourselves fully and give total honor to God? Well, actually, God described how to do that from the very beginning. Via the system of these pairs, as we'll see in a second, God has defined our purpose through the three great blessings. And he says this in the beginning, Genesis 1.28 that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So it starts with being fruitful to grow, mature in heart and in character like a fruit, and then increase in number, produce offspring, multiply, and then rule over to have dominion over that which has been given to us to be stewards of creation. And so this is actually an order. He gives a particular order. Be fruitful, then increase in number, 
then rule over. So we start with the first blessing to be fruitful. And we take the four position foundation, this, this basis for which God's love enters, and we look at it on an individual basis. This structure exists in all things. It exists in everything that we see within our universe, and it certainly exists within us. But let's look at biblical scripture here. First, we see they have the mind, you have the body of an individual. You have the spirit, you have the heart of an individual, and you have that uh, person's physical body. And their unity centered on God's love becomes the ideal person. But we look at scripture and in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44, it says, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And Ecclesiastes and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So the principle of pairs here is that within each and every individual, there is a spirit, there's a heart, there's a mind that is in relationship with the physical body we can tangibly see. And when those unite in harmony with one another, centered on God's love, which implies that there's a virtue of sacrificial love, which means that it's centered on really that spiritual desires, not our physical desires, which are personal. Um, that mind and body, just like man and woman, become one and then reflect on a personal, individual level, that of God. And that starts with our relationship. Honestly, it starts here. Our heart and God's heart becomes one in God's spirit, become one with God's spirit, then our mind and our heart. Uh, and, and then we manifest ourselves in our body and in the fullness of our ideal selves as a temple of the Lord. And, and, and we become sacred. And don't, you know, it, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? It's only possible if God's love is flowing through here. And there's that unity that Jesus has described. There is one person who reached the full, the zenith of what this looks like. And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ knew God the most. He felt God's heart the most. And in his action, he loved as God loved. And that is why he could say, Matthew 548, be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. He commissioned because in me, you see the father. In him, you see the Father. He was the one who knew God the most. And then God sent him to die. That was God's beloved. The one who knew him the most. You can imagine the one who loves you the most in your life. Letting that person go. That's God's love. You cannot, it's irrepressible love that God has for us. That, that was Jesus. Jesus was perfect. He was the ideal person. And so we see this structure that we see here is the prerequisite. It's the prerequisite uh, for the second blessing. And so all of this, we, we established a foundation. God hoped, God wished, and granted Adam and Eve um, that they fulfill their first blessing so that then they can receive God's second blessing of marriage. And so um, of course, you know, it's, a, it's natural to seek a greater, higher purpose. So as a perfected individual, that greater, higher purpose is to then come together in unity with another perfected individual, with our hearts sacred with God. Seek that partner and engage in a relationship of love with them to produce and multiply, have offspring as God intended. And so I have a personal experience of this. And, you know, my first thought when I first heard this was like, well, I'm not perfect, so I'm never going to get married. <laughs> you know, there's no way. But I'm married now. And so am I perfect? No, I'm not perfect. You know, it's a journey that we're on to perfect ourselves, that we're, we're, we're on, an eternal journey we're on to overcome our bodily desires and to, and to have God at the center of our hearts as Jesus had. And so... Um, Nonetheless, on that foundation, myself and my wife, Takayo, who is, oh man, gosh. Anyway, 
I'm, I feel incredibly blessed. <laughs> and, I, you know, every night we call and it's part of our day. I, I, I live here in the New York and she lives there in Los Angeles and we call and I have a feeling of longing every night. My hope, you know, like I look forward to that hour that, that we call together. And that's how God intended it. God wanted us to experience that kind of love. That kind, of, that kind of love with him. And he wanted to be a part of that family. But we look at our generation now who are, are seeking relationships without establishing the foundation. They don't, they don't go through the prerequisite of at least trying to build a foundation of developing their character, developing their heart. They go straight to the relationships. And what we find is that those relationships then crumble and that becomes a, a that, that becomes a model for them to follow in the future. And I'm not here to damn any of us. You know, I, we all walked our course. But us as Christian clergy, us as people who have walked that course, we now are held with the responsibility to guide our brothers and sisters to not make the same mistakes we made. To guide them through that perfection of an individual before they seek to engage in a relationship with someone else. And so... I feel I owe that in my life. I owe to the pain and to the, to the difficulties of my past to do that. I owe it to them so that they don't need to walk that kind of course. We can clean up, we, we have to clean up the individual and the family. But if we focus on fixing worldly problems, if we focus elsewhere or we put our trust in material things, we're not wiping out any enemy. The enemy is still inside our homes. The enemy is still inside of our hearts. It starts with our personal relationship with God. And that's why CLC's purpose. How do we guide young people through that course? How do we get them there? And so then what is the next higher purpose? And this lands on our final point for tonight is the third blessing is our position as stewards of creation that God intended for us to inherit what he created for us. Psalms 8, 8, 4 to 6 says, you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. And so us as human beings, as families, as a collective body, we come together and we then do the next bigger, higher purpose. And that is establishing God's kingdom on earth through our harmonious relationship with that which God has given for us to take care of. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated. The creation itself liberated from its bondage to decay and be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Creation is literally waiting for us as matured individuals with God's love at the, on our shoulders and in our hearts to relate with it. And when we do that, of course, the flip side is that we create awful things, is that when we don't have that selfless love at the center, we create some horrific things in this world. I don't need to explain it. We know it. We see it, but then we also have the opportunity when we do this to turn things that were originally bad or maybe not done with the right motivation into things that God can use, or we even create things that honor God and are directly in alignment. I, I, I just, I, I picked the three things that came to my mind. The first was the Gutenberg press. This was the first printing press. And through this machine, Although it was motivated out of a desire for, uh, for, for economic reasons, the guy that invented it, it became the first printer to print the first Bible. The first Bible that could be produced in mass production that allowed the people to then read the word of God. That's dominion. Then you have something like this, where Christ the Redeemer, where anyone who goes to this city can see that that city or whoever can just see the honoring of Jesus or even something like Zoom, <laughs> like what we're doing now, the Bible studies, church online, connecting with family, being able to be close to people. I don't know the motivation for Zoom, but I know that when we have proper dominion, we can turn these things into God's work, what God can use. So that brings us to this point. 
it's so easily all these things can be corrupted. And it starts with that first one. When we don't follow the process that God intended for us to follow, mature in heart with him, then bring that love into the family and relationship, bear children, and then those children become the leaders of tomorrow who take care of the world. When we don't follow that process, we end up seeing what we see today, which is our young people who have no idea who God is. We start from the very beginning that survey, that the characteristic of Generation Z is that they don't know how to worship and they don't know who God is. This, to me, is the work of YCLC. It's the work of ACLC. It's the work of all of us here. How do we bring our young people, our brothers and sisters, into the living relationship with God, our heavenly parent, that leads them to someday bringing God the greatest of joy and inadvertently brings them the joy that they've been searching for their whole lives. But we understand that that process is not a one and done. It's not simple. It's not a, oh yeah, I just do it. I'm just going to do it. Uh, I know for those that are married or those to be married, <laughs> it's a hard process. And uh, that's what we'll go in in the next, uh, the next session. I'm going to end here, but the next, the next session is talking about that process of growth. And in that process of growth, what went wrong? What happened? What led us astray? from being able to do this from the very beginning. So I wanna end there and uh, just two questions. What came up for you like we did last time and what effort can I make now to realize God's purpose in my life? Where am I needing growth along that, along those three, three great blessings? Where am I in need of growth?